the Apostle John wrote these words in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 18. Fear involves torment. Fear involves torment. Now the fact is that whenever our souls are controlled by any emotional power other than love, and love is more than an emotion, but when any other emotional power controls us, we suffer by reason of that control. We often hear it said at this season of the year, wouldn't it be wonderful if it could be Christmas every day? And the idea is if we could be always under the control of the emotions that are most associated with the Christmas season, we would be a much better and happier people. But is that really true? Have you ever noticed how disappointments are much more painful and sadness is much sadder during the Christmas season? You see, part of the Christmas spirit is the thought that everything will be just the way it ought to be. And the bad things and bad experiences, sadness, pain will be kept far away during Christmas. But that's not real life. And the high sentimental happiness that we idolize during the Christmas season, that's not an emotional reality either. And it makes sadness sadder. It makes disappointment more disappointing. It makes fear more frightening. But it is true that Some emotions are more damaging to us than others. Jealousy, self-pity, anger, for example. These are exceedingly dangerous and threatening emotions. These are the kind of emotions that can break and destroy relationships even with the people that are dearest to us. And if they go unchecked, they will do irreparable harm to us as well. But fear, I think, is in a category of its own. Fear is the most personally damaging of all emotions. And that's why John wrote, fear involves torment. Whether we realize it or not, fear is rooted in a deep awareness that we deserve to be punished. Fear is the apprehension of a deserved punishment. Now, we may try to deny that. Our culture works very hard to erase every thought of guilt, all thought of personal responsibility. We are told over and over again that we are not bad, we are good, that we deserve good things, not bad things. But conscience will not go away. And the presence of all sorts of fear 
is a testimony to the anticipation that all of us have in our consciences that we have earned punishment and the judgment is coming. And that is not a lie. It's really true. We have sin. We are guilty. Judgment is coming. All that's real. It's not a dream. It's not a myth. It's real. Now, there are some fears that are unreasonable. The fear of a coming punishment has given rise to some irrational fears. But fear itself is completely rational. All of us are naturally subject to death. And why? The wages of sin is death. And after death, there is judgment. It is appointed unto men to die once, and then the judgment. And so, whatever has the capacity to kill us, has the capacity to thrust us into judgment. It's not irrational to fear such things. But ultimately, what we fear is not death, It's not even judgment. Ultimately, what we fear is God. We fear this great, holy, eternal being who knows everything. Who created us and appointed our habitation, the time, the place in which we would spend our little bit of time in this world. God appointed that And God knows us. He sees us. And we know that. We may try to deny that. But that fundamentally is a witness of conscience. You're being watched. Not by big brother. But by big creator God. And what we fear is standing before this being. Who will not be flattered. Who cannot be deceived who knows everything about us, and we have an appointment with him. And that is frightening. There is a way to be prepared to meet God. Praise God. There is a way to be prepared for judgment. But I think a case could be made that no person can be ready to meet God who has not yet come to terms with the fact that God is his judge. We know that, but we have to face that. We have to confess that to ourselves. I'm God's creature. God made me. God holds me accountable. God is going to call me to give an account. Ultimately, I am accountable only to God. And I'm going to stand before him one day, and the books of my life are going to be open, and I am going to give an account. I think in order to be made ready for judgment in a way that is safe, we have to come to terms with that. We have to stop denying that. We have to confront that reality, confess that it is so. We have to deal honestly with the fear of judgment and the fear of God in order to be prepared to meet God. Now, we can be prepared to meet God. But only on his terms. 
You see, it's, it's the worst kind of self-deception to tell yourself that, that you can negotiate a settlement with God. That you can make peace with God on your terms. That by being better than you have been bad, you can earn a release from punishment. By giving away lots of money, by being helpful to lots of people, you can gain leverage with God so that he will have to accept you. That's the worst kind of self-deception. Criminals do not determine the terms of their sentence. Their judge does, and God is the judge. And God has determined that the only way to pass judgment unpunished is to be as holy as he is, as righteous as he is, as perfect as he is, as sinless as he is. You want to make it through judgment on your own, by yourself. That's what you have to do. You've already blown that, right? Already blown that. No possibility of being as holy, as righteous, as sinless as God. You have to come to terms with that. But if you do honestly come to terms with that and it humbles you and you confess that you're a bad person, not a good person, a sinner, not righteous, then you're prepared to receive the good news of what God has done. He's only done it for sinners. But for sinners, for people who know that they are too bad too far gone, too wretched, to pass judgment. God in love has, well, he's done what is almost unthinkable. He has appointed that his own son would come and take the place of the guilty. And he would take their guilt as though it were his guilt. And he would substitute himself under the judgment and wrath that their guilt deserves so that that judgment and wrath would fall on him. And for every self-aware, guilty sinner who believes on him, he will give them freely exemption from punishment. Because he is born it for them. And he will give them instead his perfect righteousness that does answer to all the requirements of God's judgment. And that's how you pass judgment. It's by believing on Jesus, embracing Jesus, making him your only hope, all your hope. His death, your death, his righteousness, your righteousness. And God promises to everyone who believes, there is therefore now no more condemnation. To those who are in Christ. And how do you get in Christ? By believing. Jesus Christ is therefore the remedy for our fear. Because remember, our fear is ultimately a fear of judgment. It's a fear of death. It's a fear of judgment. It's a fear of God. And Jesus takes away our guilt, endures our punishment, and reconciles us to God. So if we believe on Christ with the self-giving, self-denying trust, God God is reconciled to us through Christ. Now that doesn't mean that we have no more fear. It just means that our fear is irrevocably changed. From the point 
that we believe on Christ and are joined to him, our fear of God possesses the character of a child with reference to its loving father, not the character of a criminal with reference to its judge. It is a fear of adoration. It's a fear of respect. It's no longer a fear of guilt and dread. So, when we think about how do we deal with fear, the cure for fear is a proper fear of God, a fear that is mediated through Jesus Christ. And I want to emphasize this very practically. All other fears in your life will decrease or increase in accordance with with the proper fear of God. As the proper fear of God increases, other fears diminish. As the proper fear of God diminishes, other fears grow and are magnified. In our opening study of this truth, we took up the question, what are the primary characteristics of a proper fear of God? What is a, what is a proper childlike fear of God? What, is, what does it look like? And another way to ask the question, what are the primary marks of the fear of God that belongs to the Christian? What does a Christian fear of God look like? And the first such mark or characteristic is an overpowering awe before God. That's what a proper filial fear of God looks like. It, it, It looks like an overpowering awe, wonder. Astonishment in the presence of God. Kind of like much, but infinitely greater than the awe that you felt the first time you saw the Biltmore Estate and realized that one family lived in that. That was somebody's, actually, that was their vacation home. Uh, Well, the first time you saw the earth from a jet 30, 35,000 feet in the air. Remember the awe that you felt? Well, the fundamental, the first level of fear toward God appropriate to the Christian is a daily overpowering astonishment at how great and good our God is. It's a realization that our God is infinitely bigger than everything else. Whatever we fear, whatever we fear, God is infinitely bigger. And we face that, we confess that every morning. Oh, I dread this morning. I've got this to do. I've got this doctor's appointment. I, my, my hands are sweaty as I think about it. And we remember our God. Our God is infinitely bigger than that appointment, that dreaded appointment. God is with us and God is greater To live in the fear of God is to live in the repeated astonishment of who God is. How great he is. How big he is. How sufficient our God is. I went to my mailbox this morning. Um, There was a package. 
And I opened the pack. I don't get many packages. So I'm like a child. I'm ripping at the package. And it, it was a book that had been written by uh, a friend from the far distant past. I haven't seen this friend in a long time. About 48 years ago, when I started preaching here, uh, occasionally he came and preached for me. And he's written a book. And the title of the book is Since God is for Us. That's a wonderful thought. Since God, who is omnipotent, (laughs) who is omniscient, who is immutable, who is love, is for us. What could be against us? Well, that's where a proper fear of God begins. Now, secondly, characteristic number two of a proper childlike fear of God. A proper fear of God, a Christian fear of God, involves the highest regard for God's presence. The highest regard for God's presence. Turn in your Bibles, please, to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus 19. And I want to remind you that what I am reading here is history, not fiction. Exodus 19, verse 10. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Let them wash their clothes. And let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Take heed to yourselves that you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Not a hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow, whether man or beast. He shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come near the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and sanctified the people. And they washed their clothes. And he said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Do not come near your wives. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain. And the sound of the trumpet was very loud so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp. Imagine, I imagine he had to do some coaxing. Come on, we need to to come to the mountain. No, no, come on, we have to come to the mountain. He brought the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. The smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him by voice. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai, on the top of the mountain. It really happened. 
a day like today really happen. Now turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Look at verse 25. Hebrews 12, 25. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this, these words, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made, so that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace. Let us seek grace for ourselves by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear for our God is, he is what he was on Mount Sinai, a consuming fire. The presence of God on Mount Sinai was real. It was also dangerous. God demanded that his presence be treated as holy. That he be regarded with the utmost care and reverence. If any animal, if any man touched the mountain while he was there, they were to be put to death. But they were not to be touched. No one was to touch them. They were to be stoned or shot with arrows. They were defiled in a way that no one must touch them. Because they had profaned the presence of of God. And you think about that. I mean, we read those things and we kind of yawn. Why? That really happened. That is our God. Now, is God present with us today in a way like he was present on Sinai? Is God present with us today in a way like he was present on Sinai? Well, the author of Hebrews teaches us that the kingdom that was established at Sinai was a temporary kingdom with temporary institutions of law and government. By contrast, the kingdom established by Christ on the foundation of his own person and work, that kingdom is permanent and unshakable. Now, if the presence of God in the temporary was real and serious, serious, how much more real and serious is the presence of God in the kingdom of his dear son. How did God make his presence known in Sinai? With fire, smoke, an earthquake, trumpet. Remember when the temple was consecrated before that when the tabernacle was consecrated. Remember, the priest couldn't enter. Why? Because there was the cloud of God's glory was present, and they couldn't enter in. 
Remember how God revealed his presence to Moses in the wilderness by a bush that burned but wasn't consumed. Remember how God revealed the presence of Christ with the people in their wilderness wandering. They were thirsty and Christ was there as a rock that supplied water. The point is, the presence of God was real, and it was powerful. Is God's presence promised to us today? The real presence of the real God. Is that a reality today? Well, we often, we often quote Matthew 18.20. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there, Christ said. I am there in the midst. I am there. And in that context, he was saying, I am there for two reasons. I am there to answer your prayers. And I am there to confirm your discipline." I am there. I am there to hear and answer your prayers. And I am there to confirm your discipline. But the point is, I am there. I am there. Remember the Great Commission. At the end of which Christ said, Lo, I am with you always even to the end of the age. I am with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Where is God present on earth today? Wherever his church assembles, be it ever so small and weak and fragile, he is there The God of Sinai is here. Did you think about that when you came this morning? Did you think about the presence of the holy God? I'm tempted to ask for a show of hands. Of how many of you actually thought to yourself, I am going to meet with God in a way that I do not meet with God at any other place on earth. God is going to come, and I am going to that place where God comes. God is present in his word. That's the message of Hebrews 12.25. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. The one who spoke on earth is the one who is speaking today. It was God who spoke at Sinai. It was God who spoke in the old covenant. It's Christ, the incarnate word, who is speaking in the new covenant. He is speaking. And we are to tremble at his word. Do you take the word of God seriously? It's not the word of men. When the word of God is preached rightly, it's not the preaching of men. You hear the voice of a man, but it's not a man speaking. It's the living Christ who is speaking. You must not refuse the living Christ when he speaks. There is another presence of God with us. God is present in and with his individual people. A couple of familiar texts. Turn to 1 Corinthians 6, please. 1 Corinthians 6. First Corinthians 3 is a reference to God dwelling in his temple. That's a reference to the church. But this is a reference to us as individual Christians. First Corinthians 6, 19. 
Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You're not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore, let the glory of God be seen in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. How holy was the temple? What happened to any ordinary Jew who dared to even peek around the veil into the most holy place? He was struck dead. He was struck dead. Your body is the temple. The new covenant temple of the indwelling spirit of God, the glory of God, the Shekinah of God is in your body. Are you aware of that? Do you think about that? Your body is no longer your own. Your life is no longer your own to do with as you please. You have a higher calling. You are a temple. The glory of God is in you. And the glory of God is to be radiated through you. The world is to see the glory of God that's in you. That's your calling. That's what you're all about. It's the radiation of the beauty and glory of the living God. Turn to Philippians 2. Philippians 2, 12, and 13. These are familiar words. I've heard a lot of sermons on these words. Philippians 2, verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That means persevere in the things that are connected to your salvation. Persevere in faith. Persevere in repentance. Persevere in the pursuit of holiness. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling because, now notice, it is God who works in you. It's God who is at work in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. When I was with you, you were respectful of my presence, and you were careful to do what I taught you to do. Now, I'm not there. But there's a greater presence. God is present. God is in you. And with that awareness... Be diligent to believe. Be diligent to fight the good fight of faith. Be diligent to repent and to keep short accounts with God. Be diligent to pursue holiness because God is in you. God is in you. The same God It's not a different God. The same God who came down and created such fear and dread on Mount Sinai. That same God indwells your body and your soul if you are a believer in Christ. And that very God who came down on Sinai and then left, he has come to you. And he's not going to leave. He's there every day. Every morning when you awake, God is there. When you go to bed, God is there. All during the day, God is there. His glory is in you. Do you believe that? He said, well, if that were true, now I'll feel something. 
If God's in me, I ought to, there ought to be some recognition. Oh, there is. Because if God is in you, he is working in you. Both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do you ever feel conviction over sin? I, I, I don't mean just a little ping of conscience. Do you ever feel absolutely wretched because of your sin? Do you ever feel dirty? Do you ever feel so unfit for God that you draw back from him? Where does that conviction come from? Do you ever wish you had more faith? Do you ever lament the smallness of your faith? Do you ever groan because your obedience to God is is so haphazard and so inconsistent? And your heart is often cold and your love is cold. Does that bother you? Does it cause you to groan inside? That's God. That's God. That's God's presence saving you, sanctifying you, preparing you for heaven. But the presence of God is especially realized in drawing you to Christ causing you to have wonderful desires for Jesus. So much so that you can't get enough of him. You want more of him. Do you know anything about that? It's the presence of God that makes you content to leave your eternity in Jesus' hands. Earlier, I I spoke about judgment and death. I'm getting old. I'm really old. I I didn't need to tell you that. You you got eyes. Death is getting closer. And I think about death more than I ever thought about death before. But I don't think about death nearly as much as I ought to, seeing I'm so close to it. Now, I I know I'm going to stand before God. And it ought to terrify me, but it really doesn't. And sometimes I wonder, what's wrong with you? Well, I'm content to leave my death and my appearance before God with Jesus. Jesus. I've turned it all over to him. Well, he gave me the faith (laughs) to turn it over to him. But I put it all in his hands. When death comes, how it comes, what I'm going to experience a millisecond after my soul leaves my body, and when I appear in the presence of God and, and, and... I leave that with Jesus. And I'm content. I'm content to leave it with him. I I don't think I need anything more than Christ. Now, where did I get that? Where did I get that level of confidence in Jesus, whom I've never seen with my eyes or touched with my hands? How could I have such confidence in Christ? God gave it to me. That's the work of God in me. It's also the work of God in me that makes me so joyful when I really get closer to Christ. There is a satisfaction that comes in being shut up to Jesus and cutting off the noise and just Communing with him. There's there's peace and there's joy and there's satisfaction. Why? Because God is there. 
filling my soul with grace. It's God's presence that enables you to experience peace in the midst of your war, when you roll your burdens over on Christ, when you finally say, I can't bear this anymore, it's too heavy, too big, I give it to Christ. And when you really do that, there is this peace that washes over you. Where does that come from? It comes from God, the God who is there. The God who is in you. Beloved, listen. All genuine Christian experience. Now those of you who are not Christians, you don't have a clue what Christian experience is. I just described some of it. All True Christian experience is the result of the real presence of God in the souls of his people. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So where is the God of Sinai? He's in this place. He's in the preaching of his word. He's in the souls of his people. Well, does that mean that we ought to be trembling like the people at Sinai were trembling, afraid, scared? No. Because the presence of God that is given to us, is given through the mediation of his Son. It's not given to condemn us or to terrify us. It's given to save us and to comfort us and to strengthen us. But there is, there is to be an emotional response Listen to the words of Hebrews 12, 28 and 29 again. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace. Doesn't happen automatically. We have to seek grace by which we may serve, worship, interact with God acceptably with reverence with deep regard and respect and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. And if we were this close to God without Christ, we would be incinerated. If it weren't for Christ. Christ makes God safe for us who believe on him. So no, we're not to be filled with dread or horror or alarm. But beloved, neither are we to be flippant and casual and thoughtless. Our God is a consuming fire. And we're to serve him with reverence and godly fear. So we are to be sober-minded, not sad, okay, not sad, joyful, but our joy is to be serious joy, not flippant. We are to be sober-minded, we are to be thoughtful, we are to be intensely reverent and careful. When we pray, we are to be thoughtful. We're to remember who God is and who we are, how much we need Jesus. And when we come to church, we're not to be afraid. We're to be eager. But we're to think about what we're doing. We're to think about this God with whom we're going to have dealings. 
And we're to ask him to search us and try us and flush out the garbage and all the things about us that would offend him and grieve his spirit. We're to ask him to show those things to us so we can repent of them. And we're to come into his presence with clean hands and a pure heart. We're to come sincerely, joyfully, joyfully, because we're accepted in Christ. He's our father, not our judge. And yet we're to come with an awareness that he is God and we're not. He is holy. As I said earlier, the truth is God's presence is with us all the time. You say, well, that, that's really nothing revelatory. God is omnipresent. Everything is in the presence of God. The devil's in the presence of God. All the fallen angels, demons are in the presence of God. What's the difference? A big difference. The presence of God given to us is a covenant presence. It's a presence of God's covenant commitment. I have called you to be my people, and I have made myself to be your God. And I am with you as the God who forgives. And I am with you as the God who saves. And I am with you as your heavenly father. I am with you as your protector. I am there to guide you. This is a wonderful thought. But it is to be a sobering thought. This is a distinct element of the right fear of God. It's an awareness of God's holy presence all the time, everywhere we go. He's with us. Are you glad for that? Or do you wish you could get out of God's presence once in a while? Beloved, can you understand how the real presence of God, to the extent that we're aware of it, and we're supposed to be more aware of it than we are, but can you understand how the real presence, the covenant presence of God, will greatly alleviate all your natural fears? There's so many words in the Bible we have memorized and we don't think about them very carefully. How about these words? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because... What? Why? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for... What does it say? Thou art with me. (laughs) You are with me. And he is with us in a more powerful way than he was with David. And David said, I will not be afraid because you are with me. Jesus died for us that God might not only be for us, but with us. Now I want to ask you some questions and I'm finished. Do you believe it? Do you believe in the real presence of God with you? Do you reverence God's presence? Does God's presence have a sanctifying impact on you? When you're getting ready to say something that you know you shouldn't say, does the awareness that God is present cause you to bite your tongue? 
Does the presence of God keep you from going places you ought not to go? Seeing things you ought not to see? What impact does the presence of God have on you? Do you revere his presence? Do you speak to him first thing in the morning because you believe he's there? Do you fellowship with him? Do you commune with him? Do you seek your deepest and best joys from him? Or do you complain a lot? Beloved, listen, listen. Does this make sense? If the living God is with us and in us, is there there any reason we should not be satisfied with his fullness all the time? Why are we so dissatisfied? What do you think will satisfy you if he doesn't? Is there anything better than to have God with you? There's a knot. And if we would just learn to believe in his presence and to commune and to drink deeply of him and to talk to him and trust him, we'd be a much happier people. I hear people say, I'm I'm lonely, I don't have any friends. And I would not make light of that at all. I'm not. I'm an only kid. I know a lot about spending time alone. I probably got that down to a science. And my wife will tell you that's not good. Because I'm not a good companion. I've just learned, I've just learned to be content by myself. That's not good. But beloved, there is no better companion than the indwelling Christ. There's no better friend. There's nobody that can satisfy your deepest needs like Jesus can. Will you believe that? There are only two classes of people here this morning. People who live in God's special presence and people who are cut off from God's special presence. And what I've been talking about is as foreign as it could possibly be to some of you. And that's because you're alienated from God. Believe me, you don't want to live alienated from God and most certainly you don't want to die alienated from God. And you don't have to be. You don't have to be. You can be at peace with God. You can be close to God today. The same way I'm close, through Christ, by confessing sin to him and trusting him and giving ourselves up to him in faith. He will make us to be right with God and God will take up residence in our souls. He'll do that for you. You talk about life changing. Nothing will change you like Jesus. That's right. To Father, words, uh, words are, they're just words. And they're so inadequate. They're so inadequate to describe the reality of you. So inadequate to describe the reality of your presence in the souls of your people. But you work through words. And I ask, I ask you, Father, to work through these words and to make your presence a felt reality in the hearts of all your people. 
May none of your people doubt the reality of your presence. May we learn how to live in your presence and how to walk in your presence and trust your presence and enjoy your presence. Help us. We are weak. Help us. And there are some, no doubt, in this room who are cut off from you. They're your enemies. If they were to die in their present condition, there would be no hope for them. But, Father, they're not dead. They're alive. And I ask that you would draw them to yourself. Draw them to Jesus. Give them faith in him. Now dismiss us with your blessing. May we know your peace. May we know the joy of having you to be our God and to be your people. In Christ's name, amen.